Comparators. What are they good for? Unlike the famous song and its subject of war, I'd suggest that comparators are, are pretty good for a lot of things, not absolutely nothing. Um, but they're also, I think, misunderstood because it's a phrase and terminology that, that people may not be familiar with. I wasn't familiar with comparators before I started working with Zoya, uh, but now they are one of the most indispensable modules to me. So I'm going to begin by defining them, then I'm going to give a couple of analogies, and then I'm going to show some real examples of how I've used them in my own patches. Um, nothing about this is definitive. I want to say that very clearly. There are uses of comparators that I'm sure I haven't imagined yet. Um, but these might give you some ideas of ways in which they can be practically applied, uh, what they do, how they can be used creatively. Uh, to achieve a lot of different types of goals. So the definition. At its base, a comparator is really just a... a pretty simple mathematical proposition. A number is greater than or less than uh, another number. So <clears throat> you have a positive input and a negative input, and when the positive input exceeds the negative input, the output is 1 uh, from the comparator, and it's greater than. Before that, it's less than, and the output is either 0 or negative 1, uh, depending on what sort of outcome you would like to have. Um, and so the, the simplest analogy I can make for a comparator uh, is of a scale. So this is the CV version of a scale. I have a negative input. There's nothing in my positive input. Uh, and as I add to the positive input at a certain point, it will exceed the negative input, input, and our light will flick on and say this number is greater than the number at the, the negative input. Uh, just like a scale would, you know, if you think of the negative input as the counterweight. Um, and you keep adding, I don't know, witches onto one end. Uh, so another analogy that I thought of, because it's winter here in, in West Virginia, is that of a thermostat. Um, a thermostat regulates temperature. So as heat rises or falls, as temperature rises or falls, it reacts to that. And this is another important facet of a comparator. You can add numbers to it. But it can also respond to dynamic environments and tell you when a threshold has been passed. Um, so right now, we have it set for uh, AC. No, for heat. And what that means is we have a positive input of 50 degrees, let's say, which in Fahrenheit will be too cold and in Celsius will be too hot for all of the people who may be watching this in various parts of the world. But we're going to go with, with 50 degrees. Uh, and that's coming in through this switch uh, into the positive input. We also have a sine wave, uh, LFO, representing fluctuating temperature. And so one way to, to look at this is that it's, it's measuring when this variable that's in the negative input uh, goes low. So when the temperature drops below 50, when, when the sine wave 
falls below its halfway point, our AC kicks on, or our heat kicks on. And I put these on a switch so that I can reverse them, and suddenly we have air conditioning. And now when our temperature rises above a certain point, our AC kicks on. So before it was in the negative input so that we could see when something fell below a threshold uh, and, and produce a positive value. Uh, when it's in the, the positive input, we're looking for when something exceeds a, a threshold. Um, and then the final example I, I thought of uh, was an audio gate. And in fact, I built an audio gate. So what happens here is our CV comes in through an envelope follower, which uh, analyzes it and d defines its magnitude, its, its volume. And that goes into the positive input of a comparator. And the negative input, uh, we have an arbitrary value. Uh, and then the output is going to a VCA and a fuzz is set up preceding the VCA so that fuzz has been running the entire time I've been talking and if I very lightly strum we can see our gate open <laughs> If we push our negative input higher, that is the, the threshold that the positive input has to pass. If I play lightly, nothing gets through. If I push it even higher, only my, my strongest uh, notes come through. And if I push this back all the way down to zero, which may take a second, some of these demonstrations would be easier if there was a course mode for the knob. Just saying. Our noise gate stops working. So those are just three analogies that I thought people might be familiar with that might make understanding what comparators do a little bit easier. Uh, in the next part, I'm gonna walk through a couple of patches and show how I use uh, comparators in a couple of different ways, some of which are like this, uh, some of which are a little bit different. All right. I wanted to add an addendum to this section uh, because I, I glossed over it. I probably gloss over this too often, and it's an important uh, facet that that uh, I think can really help you do some interesting things in, in patching with uh, uh, Zoya, which is that the inputs are not usually limited to one source. Um, and so, you know, for instance, with this comparator, this is our thermostat. Instead of using one sine wave to determine uh, when our, our threshold for AC or heat has been passed, I'm using two sine waves at different rates, uh, and they're connected at 50%, so that at their highest point, the sum will be one, and at their lowest point, the, the sum will be zero. Uh, and so if you watch the, the output of the comparator, uh, it, it, it's far less regular than if we used one sine wave. And that can be used as a benefit. This is a way to, to generate random and quasi-random events um, to, to create gates from two different sort of clocks or rhythms. Um, and there are, I, I just wanted to point out that, that any of these inputs um, you know, the positive input, the negative input, most CV inputs uh, can accept more than one source. And by, you know, making sure that they're balanced, uh, 
using the, the connection strength, um, you can achieve all sorts of interesting effects. So I've loaded up my tuner patch, which I haven't loaded up the firmware that I was sent that shows a bug fix for it, so it does interesting things. Uh, I, as I understand it, a subsequent firmware will make this much more reliably show shapes in the uh, Latin alphabet um, that correspond to chromatic notes. But for now, it, it may not do that. <clears throat> but one thing I wanted to talk about that this patch does in a number of different ways is use comparators in what I think of as an array. Um, so you might wonder how does it know what note to display, and you might wonder, this keeps track of the octave, how does it know what octave to display? And both of those come from different comparator arrays. Come back to that. So this comparator array is set up <laughs> So that as each note is played, they will go high. So if I play A, only this one goes high and its negative input is set to, to zero. If I play A sharp, then this one will also go high, and I've set its negative input to one interval above uh, A, and, and so on. Let me... So what's happening here is that as every note comes in, the pitch detector gives it a CV value. But that CV value is in its own CV scale. It doesn't say A, it says, you know, two, uh, 0.20. Uh, it doesn't say A sharp, it says 0.208. Um, and so this comparator array is being used to identify which specific node it is. And then that's going to a switch on this page. And if we look at the connection to any given node, it's set up to, to this value for each one because they'll each add at the input of the switch. So, a will open channel 1, A sharp will open channel 2, B will open channel 3, and so on. And those uh, <coughs> channels tell the, the UI buttons how to behave. Um, what, what note is being played. So there are a couple of different comparator arrays in, in here. This one tells us what octave we're in, probably. As we keep going higher, uh, <sighs> these different lights light up. That's used on the, the front page to play display, but it's also used to subtract the octave away from each of these notes, because I don't want to know when the the threshold passes A3. I want to know when it passes A and moves into A sharp in any octave. Um, and so, again, the pitch detector will produce a, a value that's associated with the note, but also the octave. And these values are inverted and sent to the input of each of the the uh, the note 
detectors, essentially, so that it, it shears away um, those differences. And then there's one more comparator array that's used in here. These are all comparators. And what they do is they analyze the, the incoming audio and what the pitch detector produces against a quantized note. And the quantizer will produce the, the closest note. Uh, and so as it's, uh, this is sharp. No, that's flat. I forgot I did this in reverse. So as you tune, this is used to show how close you are to being in tune. And these are all successive values uh, based on the difference between those notes to show when certain thresholds have been passed. Um, and I had to, to change the, the level of the CV in order to, to make those comparisons because it centers around zero and one thing that comparators aren't always the best at is uh, dealing with negative numbers because the negative input can't be biased to negative numbers. Uh, so that's a comparator array. So another patch where I use comparators uh, quite a bit is my recent uh, degenerate gain take on uh, generation loss uh, patch. And I use them uh, in this patch particularly to affect uh, waveforms and, and different wave shapes. So I'm going to go through a couple of those. Um, the first one is the modulation for the flutter control. And if we look at this comparator, this is a comparator, basically what's happening is that the LFO that's used is a, a 1 to negative 1 triangle wave. And every time the wave passes through zero, uh, the comparator goes low. And then when it rises back up above zero, it goes high. And that is used uh, for a trigger that then goes to a, a random uh, LFO. I ended up using a trigger rather than connecting the uh, random module directly to the comparator because I found that it gave a better response in that particular case. Um, a lot of times I would just directly connect the two. So the whole idea there is that uh, each time the half of the, the triangle wave cycles below uh, around zero, around a center point of zero, it gets a, a different depth. So, you know, if we think of this as zero, then what happens is the triangle wave goes up, then it hits the comparator, uh, and it keeps going down. Sorry, I wasn't thinking about this. And then the next time, uh, the, the LFO is tied to the random uh, output at a multiplier. So the next time it might look like this. And the next time it might look like this. And this is how you generate the, the random pitch modulation in that particular case. Um, so that's one way that I use comparators in this patch. There are actually uh, three different ways that I use the comparators. I'm going to go to the next uh, modulation. <coughs> and this is uh, the modulation for the WOW Control, which also is being used to, to generate uh, random values. So the way that that modulation is generated, the way that I, I ended up being most satisfied with um, was to use two random modules uh, to shape the depth of a sine wave. And the way that, that it works is as... Uh, an end of cycle trigger. 
So the sine wave goes to the positive input of the comparator and the negative input is biased to, to negative uh, to 0 0.001. And essentially what that means is that uh, the, the comparator's output is positive until it reaches the end of its cycle at zero. Um, so if we imagine our sine wave, each time it hits that zero point, there's a ding. And that ding sends a, a trigger to the random modules, which create new depths for the, the next wave of the, the modulation. Um, so the, the output ends up looking, you know, like our triangle wave where we have, and there's also some uh, uh, speed variation that's going in there. So it doesn't look like that at all. It looks, and some, other modulation that makes it drop above and below zero. But the general idea of what the comparator is doing there is to create different depths for each cycle of the sine wave, for each complete cycle of the sine wave. And then there's a third way, and this one I think is really actually pretty good. Uh, there's a third way that the, the comparator is used. And that is, so the way that the triangle waveform is generated is that it's actually a looping ADSR. Um, so this is our attack side and this is our decay side and they're tied so that they're equal. And I was, the, the generation loss has a triangle wave and a square wave. This is a big development um, for ramping. And originally I had used a square wave LFO. And the problem with that is that uh, their, their rates would be very different. So if we follow the output of this looping attack decay envelope, it goes into a comparator. Um, and the negative input is set to 0.5. And if we look at the output of the comparator, it looks like a square wave because it is a square wave. It's modulating between one and zero and one and zero, right? The comparator goes high and goes low and this looks like a square wave. And basically what's happening is that each time the triangle wave reaches the midpoint of its rise, uh, it's the input of the, the, the comparator goes high and we get one half of our square wave. And then it reaches the other half and it goes low. And so what happens there is that you generate a square wave that has uh, the same rate, uh, the same speed as the triangle wave. Uh, from the, the triangle wave itself. And so, you know, there are a lot of different ways that you can use comparators to shape waves, um, to trigger random elements, to figure out what's going on in a specific waveform. Uh, when a wave has, you know, in the, the previous example with the wow, I used an end of cycle trigger. But if I had made the negative input one, then it would be a, a end of rise trigger. Um, so every time that the sine wave reached the height of, of its uh, curve, there would be a new trigger. Um, and so they're good for determining what's going on in a, a given patch and, and creating responses that respond to that dynamic environment. Um, particularly with, with waveforms, they can be a really good analysis tool. So that's another way to use comparators. So this is a patch that I started to work on when I was thinking about different ways to show off what a comparator could do. Um, and it's one that I've suggested to, to other people as a, a way that a 
comparator could be used. Uh, I'm not sure I've seen it uh, published in a, a patch storage uh, file, but I think it's a pretty useful one. So essentially, this is a, a patch that um, uses comparators as thresholds um, and reacts to the dynamics of your plane. So you can, you know, uh, do this by directly connecting an expression or a, a envelope follower to some parameter, and it'll react. The idea here is that it will only react after a certain threshold has been met. Um, and so what I have is the envelope follower coming in to, to two different comparators. In one case, we have uh, a, a low threshold. So when the envelope follower passes the amplitude of this low threshold that's set, this comparator will go low and things will, will turn off. We also have a high threshold. And when the envelope follower goes above this amount, the high threshold will uh, kick in and there will be reactions based on that. And you can determine what you want to do with them. Right now I have it set up pretty simply so that um, I have a delay and a, a send to that delay. And if I play quietly, nothing happens. But if I dig in some more, the delay is sent to. Um, and I can also use a low threshold for that. I keep going over my low threshold though. Which these thresholds can create interesting effects. Uh, some of it's a little bit like a backwards delay. You get some very staccato uh, plane circumstances. So now I've, I've set it so it uses the low threshold. And I need to work on it a little bit because as you can hear what, what's happening with those clicks is that it's catching the early part of a note before it rises above uh, that threshold. So it's not great, um, but it, again, it does produce some interesting effects. And I think if you refined it, as I hope to, uh, then you could produce a, a pretty interesting and responsive patch that would allow you to, to cater effects uh, to your plane dynamics in a way that simply using an envelope follower would not, because an envelope follower is just going to, to begin applying CV uh, to some input, whereas this would allow you to say, all right, you know, I want this to be based on my plane dynamics, but I don't want it to, to impact uh, the sound of my patch before a threshold has has been reached. So yeah, those are some different ways that, that comparators can be used. This is not at all exhaustive. Comparators are, are really uh, versatile, useful things. Um, but hopefully this gives you some ideas of ways that you could use them in your own patches. Uh, and some ways that I haven't thought of. Um, thank you.